Okay, while this is getting uh, started, um, I just want to say that as we go, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, this is a presentation, but I don't want you to think of it just as a lecture, this is, is a discussion. Obviously, as I go through, if there's an images or something, if you have a question, feel free to stop me in the middle uh, if there's something pertinent to that particular image. And then after myself, um, Danny will speak, and then we'll open it up uh, at the end to questions for uh, Professor Cobra, Danny, and myself. Okay. Make sure to wait. Make sure to wait. <laughs> 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 huh? <coughs> DJ, could you tell us um, the title of uh, the topic? Gonna, some people just came in. Okay, so the topic is the deep history of Capoeira Angola. Now that's that deep history. <laughs> deep history. <laughs> All right. And, and we're so fortunate to have so many people in the room that can help with the history. We have TJ, we have um, Daniel Dawson, Cobra Mansa, and so many other people, even Cabello's here, other people who have been taking the time to do the research and all the history. So don't wait till you go home to come up with questions. Just think about them for this. All right. Um, and I'm going to ask you... Oh, and Mr. Timber's here, too. Uh, you're, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm actually going to uh, sit down just because of technical things. I've got to work off of two computers at the same time. Uh, but uh, I should still be able to see everyone. Okay. First of all, I'd like to uh, dedicate this talk to my mentor. First and foremost, Steve Daniel Dawson. I know why you're talking about me, Premier. Mm -hmm. You're the one who taught me everything I know. <laughs> Robert Ferris Thompson and, of course, Mr. John Grange. Um. Oh, done. <laughs> Wrong computer. Okay. Capoeira de da Africa, Africano King Uto. These lines, which can roughly be translated as Capoeira came from Africa, the African who fought, uh, were sung by uh, Messi Pachinha, who systematized and opened the first uh, academy of Capoeira Angola in Brazil, as we all know. Uh, Mr. Pachinha stressed that Capoeira Angola, or the Jogo de Capoeira, as it was known in Rio, in the, where I'll be talking about, was built upon African sources uh, and used by bondsmen in Brazil to resist the slave system. This African origin of the Jogo de Capoeira has been vehemently denied by most scholars who studied the art. Mostly uh, anthropologists and sociologists looking at contemporary Capoeira practices have seen no evidence to support the unpatriotic belief uh, that any particular African provenance of the art existed. In particular, <coughs> um, uh, a bad image, I'm sorry, this is an <coughs> image of the book Capoeira Angola um, by Dr. Rego, uh, in a very arrogant tone warned that Mestre Pachinha, quote, didn't have the cultural level, unquote, to defend his position on the African origins of the art. Such, uh, such scholars uh, have rather promoted one of three alternative origin myths that I will discuss here. So the aim of this paper is to place these um, fundamentally polemical mythic origins in their historical context and to explore uh, the deeper history of Capoeira Angola. So we, oh, and I don't, you have a laser pointer? Thank you, sir. All right. So we are used to thinking of capoeira and its association with Salvador, but we have to put capoeira uh, in its historical context. And we'll start out, uh, capoeira first kind of comes on the historical radar not in Salvador, where it doesn't show up for, much, for almost a century later, but in Rio de Janeiro, much further south. Uh, so it's Rio, the city of Rio de Janeiro, rather than uh, Salvador, which was the historical epicenter for Capoeira's history in Brazil uh, during the time of slavery. Now, Rio de Janeiro uh, replaced uh, Salvador in uh, 1763 as the capital of Brazil. And this was 
uh, for a large part due to the proximity of Rio to the, uh, the mines in Minas Gerais. It was a closer, easier transportation to get things from the mine uh, to the coast at Rio. It, and it became very quickly the second largest city in all of the Americas, second only to uh, Mexico City, much larger than uh, New York City at the time. Now, our best historical document from the 18th century uh, comes from 1783, and it's a criminal record of a slave named Adam whose master uh, whose master was surprised uh, he, his master wrote in this uh, court report that when he first purchased Adam as a young slave he was a very strong but very uh, gifted young slave a very obedient young slave and as Adal went out uh, in the days to uh, go about his chores, he would start coming home later and later. <coughs> and tell what the master had, his master feared would happen, and that is that Adal never came back to the house. And although he expected to find that Adal had run away outside of the city to uh, Quilombo, as you guys all know, uh, Maroon community, <coughs> um, in no, fact, I said no. No? They don't know for Kilombo. Oh, that, okay, well, we'll come back to that, and I think you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah so that, that you'll understand by the end of this, yeah. by the end of, of Danny's talk. Um, so, it, but basically, in short, it was, uh, these were communities of self-liberated Africans who ran away from slavery and founded their own societies uh, <laughs> in the interior, right, in rural areas, usually in remote areas. Um, now, uh, so Adam's master found that he had been arrested uh, for capoeira. He had been arrested in the community of a number of other capoeiras, and I'm going to talk about the vocabulary in a second. And his master pleaded for his release. He was given, he was severely um, beaten with a whip um, and was sentenced to forced labor, which his master interceded on behalf of the slave and asked for a shorter uh, time uh, incarceration, which really meant uh, forced labor. Now, one thing that's clear about this early document is that we know two things. First of all, we know that uh, Kapurajin was completely criminalized by the, set, by the uh, later part of the 18th century. And we already know that uh, the Jogo de Capoeira and Kapurajin uh, was highly associated with slaves who worked for hire, the Ganyu. So slavery in a place like Rio de Janeiro worked very differently from the image of slavery that we have uh, from the American South or from the Caribbean, where slaves worked on large cotton plantations, rice plantations, etc. In Rio, most slaveholders only owned a handful of slaves, and they made their money <coughs> by sending those slaves out into the city to, to work uh, as day laborers. And in a city like uh, Rio, Nothing, the city could not function without these slaves. They did all essential uh, activities in the city. Uh, so, for example, you notice these, uh, these men with the, the barrels on their heads. So if you owned a house in Rio, you got up in the morning and you wanted water to take a bath, cook breakfast, you'd have to go out your window, lean out your window, and whistle for one of these ganyadores to come. And you would pay them to go to the well uh, this is the slaves fighting over water at the well to bring bring you water uh, to cook your bay to do whatever, whatever else you needed to. All the goods that are transported to re throughout the city are all carried on the backs of these ganadores. And now I think probably one of the worst jobs and they, they, the, the jobs that, that these ganadores took was completely varied. Some of them would go out if they had a skill 
maybe as they were had skills as a medical practitioners uh, in Africa, they might go to this go to uh, an open area, set up a stall, and pay people for cures. Uh, they might it might be very physical labor if they have any type of skill. Probably the worst uh, <coughs> job you could have as a ganyador was uh, these slaves that were called tigris, mm -hmm. and these slaves. Uh, job in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, there was no sanitation system in Rio de Janeiro. So when people had to go to the bathroom, they handled their business in chamber pots. And then again, you, in the evening, you would pass, push the contents of these pots into these big barrels, and the slaves would carry these barrels down to the ocean to distribute it. And they were called tigris because the the acid from the fecal matter would drip onto their skin um, and cause white dots against their black skin. And that's why they were called tigers. Um, but as, as difficult as life was for, for ganadores, they had to um, pay a quota to their master uh, every so often, and this, there was some variation in how often they would have to pay their master. If they didn't make the amount they, that they were supposed to, they'd be severely beaten. Um, so it wasn't an easy life, and obviously it was very physically demanding. But in comparison to uh, life on a plantation slave, uh, in a plantation slave system, such as a sugar plantation in the Caribbean, they had a lot of physical mobility. They had to be able to move around the city um, quite freely. And because so many slaves moved around the, sla uh, the city quite freely to make money for their masters, they, uh, they had, in a sense, time to gather up in groups and practice things such as the Jogo de Capoeira. Now, when we come to the 19th century, uh, we have a very clear, um, much clearer description of the art, and we have to be clear for our discussion about the appropriate language, because the language that we use now to describe the art is quite different from the language that was used during the time of slavery. Nowadays, uh, we refer to what we do at this conference as capoeira, but in the time of slavery, the term capoeira rather referred to someone who was a in fully initiated member in a, a society that was dedicated to this martial art. Okay, so people who practiced the martial arts were called capoeiras, <laughs> whereas today we call them capoeiristas. But in the time of slavery, this was what capoeira meant, was one of these individuals who was uh, fully initiated into these closed societies. The thing that we do in our hodas would have been referred to as the jogo de capoeira. Right, the jogo. This is the game much akin to what we do now. And then there's this other term that was used, which was capoeiragem. And capoeiragem referred most specifically to the activities and most specifically to the street fighting uh, activities <laughs> of members of these capoeira societies. Okay. Um, now the, the police often use the term capoeiragem to refer to anything related <coughs> to these capoeiras. Okay, so uh, dressing like a capoeira, uh, whistling like a capoeira, using certain uh, ritual emblems of capoeira, all of them would be, could be referred to as capoeiragem. But uh, probably more specifically, uh, we can refer to capoeiragem as this uh, the actual activities of these capoeiras. Now, the jogo, uh, the jogo de capoeira was heavily um, repressed, and the height, as we, as I mentioned, this was completely criminalized by the second half of the 18th century. Already, it was listed as. Uh, one of the two most uh, uh, repressed uh, activities by slaves. And this repression only increased in 1808 when um, the emperor, Don Juan the, uh, the Sixth, moved his 
capital from Lisbon to Rio because he was afraid that Napoleon was going to attack. Napoleon was moving into Iberia, so he moves his capital to Rio de Janeiro. And this is he and his son. Uh, when this happens, a new police force is created in Rio de Janeiro, and this police force is designed almost exclu exclusively to control enslaved Africans. This is a huge concern um, by the authorities. Uh, in 1822, uh, the Emperor um, John Pedro I, the, the son here on the right, uh, wrote a letter to the chief of police uh, <coughs> reprimanding him for not, try, not being able to control the capoeiras, and in fact often offered free uh, paid vacation for any policeman who could capture a capoeira. In 1829, all whipping was to be done not publicly anymore or not by private individuals. If your slave in Rio was acting up, you were not allowed to administer more than 50 lashes of the whip yourself. Anything more than that had to be done by the police in the in this special prison designed for uh, slaves. There are only two exceptions to this rule. Uh, the first is people who ran away to join these quilombos, these maroon communities, and the second is these capoeiras, who were rather whipped publicly still in uh, Campo Santana, and then they would be marched back to uh, the jail where they'd have their wounds rubbed down with uh, vinegar and pepper. Oh, God. <coughs> Once there, they would receive um, their sentencing, uh, and this again would often be up to three months of forced labor um, working either on, uh, on mostly in construction now let me talk a little bit about the capoeira associations themselves these were there were numerous terms used for um, these associations probably the most common was maltas now many um, scholars translate this as gangs. But these are not gangs in the sense of like the dead rabbits who are their contemporaries in New York. So not gangs. These are closed societies, what we often refer to as secret societies. Okay? Like, un completely unlike the dead rabbit society, these were hierarchical and segmented societies. Um, when I say they're hierarchical, there was at least five levels of initiation in these societies. The first level of initiation were, uh, was to be a moleki. Now, the term moleki is an Angolan term which refers to an uninitiated youth. It was, the term was co-opted by the Portuguese slave traders and used it to describe uh, young boys of a certain age in the slave trade to give them a set price. But in the, in the Maltas of Capoeira, the term is used in the original African context, context of an uninitiated person. These young people would, uh, were kind of like the groupies or the auxiliaries of the Maltas, and they did little errands for them, such as uh, carry their weapons for them, and things like that. The next stage was uh, to become a, a Kashingeli, which were the Molekes who are now in formal training under the Maltas. Uh, they were trained by elders in the different Maltas, and their training included uh, using the head, using the feet, um, and then in the second half of the 19th century, using weapons. They started out training with wooden weapons, and then after they got good enough with wooden weapons, they were trained uh, with with uh, steel weapons. The, um, once they completed their training, they became what was known as a uh, amador, an amateur, or uh, capoeira jubilado, which were just uh, people who had com completed their training um, in the Jogo de Capoeira and Capoeira but had not become full members of the society yet. To become a capoeira required a special initiation ceremony called the oath ceremony, which often took place in uh, church top bell towers. 
once you became initiated as a capoeira for the first time you were allowed to don the ritual emblems of capoeira um, these uh, these hats particularly a red hat which was re- recognized as a symbol of capoeira red and white hat um, and carrying ribbons again red and white being predominant colors for these ribbons and the special clothing that capoeiras wore after that people could become uh, move up further to become a chief of a capoeira Malta uh, and the chiefs were uh, very often African born and this is this is significant in the second half of the 19th century in that there are very few African born people in the second half of the 19th century because the slave trade effectively comes to an end around the 1850s many uh, Africans retain the African born retain the title of chief of Kapwood and these were also uh, the best fighters in the Malta would have to rise would rise to become the chief and this was important because although it, at some times cop, these Capoeira Maltas would clash kind of in street rumbles against each other at other times uh, some question of, of honor between them would be settled in hand-to-hand combat between the two chiefs of the societies and then above that there were uh, these larger uh, chiefs of chiefs who organized who were in charge of entire different Maltas that kind of stood above uh, groups of Malta. So this, these are highly organized and segmented so- societies. Each parish, and these Maltas tended to be based in, around um, uh, around churches, and they would have their headquarters and church towers. Each so each parish would have its own Malta, and these Maltas and the, the, the Capoeiras themselves referred to these as houses. And then these houses were organized into what were called provinces, uh, which were larger groupings of these of these Malta. Okay, and I'm taking way too much time, so I'm going to press ahead. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the um, fighting. The fighting system of these. Uh, Malta. So in the first half of the, of the 19th century, capoeiras were most associated with headbutting. Uh, in, in real fights, they tended to use headbutts, and we have records, we have a document from an English visitor to Rio who described how uh, some of these capoeiras would be hired as assassins and they would kill their victims just with headbutts. By the second half of the 19th century, um, during the 19th century, there was a gradual increase also in the use of weapons. And by the end of the 19th century, battles between capoeiras would look something like this, where we have sticks, straight razors, headbutts, foot sweeps, kicks, all together in a, in a general street fight melee type of thing. And above all, at least in the iconography, capoeira became most associated with the straight razor. And in political cartoons, if you wanted to show that someone was a capoeira, you just put a razor in their hand to represent that this woman is a a, a capoeira. Now, so we have to be clear between capoeiragem, which was these all-out street fights where all these weapons are used, and the jogus, which are ritual, specific ritual practices. Now there were actually more than one jogu in ni- early 19th century um, Rio. There were actually three. There was a jogu de pancadas, there was a, a stick fighting uh, game, then there was jogu de um, cabezadas, a headbutting game, and then there was the Jogo de Capoeira. <laughs> um, the Jogo de Capoeira, uh, we could, uh, for time purposes, I'm going to keep pushing ahead, but we could talk a little bit about this image, which I find very interesting, because Rugendas, who drew this, actually describes headbutting, not kicking although his picture looks completely different. So it seems that he conflated the Jogo de Capoeira and uh, the Jogo de Cabezadas together. 
Now, um, the, the techniques in the Jogo de Capoeira, uh, again, we see this, uh, the bodies are kept, not kept rigid in fighting stances, but kept in motion, um, which by the um, end of the 19th century is referred to by the term Jinga. We see that term by the end of the 19th century. There are other, there are, but there are many other terms uh, for that same movement. Foot sweeps, and of course, the most characteristic uh, elements of the Jogo de Capoeira were kicks. Uh, the two most uh, widely described techniques in the second half of the 19th century and the turn of the century as the habudihaya, as we know it, or habudihaya with two feet, uh, which we don't really do anymore, but was common in the old days, and the pentana, where you brought both feet straight over. This one was called habudihaya too. Yeah, this one was also called habudihaya depending on the, the author. So, I want to ask the question, do these techniques, does this fighting system have a deeper history? And I would say yes, that uh, we can trace a much deeper history to this fighting system. And this again now enters into the, uh, a very hotly debated topic. And I want to make it clear that what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that the Jogo de Capoeira is not Brazilian. It is Brazilian, um, but it also has a very specific ca African legacy. So it is Brazilian in the same way that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is Brazilian. Okay? Now everyone knows, you guys are familiar with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? If you've watched mixed martial arts uh, at all, you, this has transformed the... Uh, we have an expert right here, Abel, right? Now, Everyone, no one has a problem calling Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Brazilian. And Helio Gracie, the, the, the head of the art, has no problem saying that the art was developed in, he traces it back to Japan and ultimately back to India. No one has a problem with that. But it becomes very problematic somehow with Capoeira to acknowledge it to be Brazilian and also acknowledge its African, direct African roots. And I'm saying that Capoeira is Brazilian, just like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is Brazilian, and it's also African, just like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu -Jiu is Asian. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, there are a number of alternate at the end, in the, in the early 20th century, the scholars who started to describe the Jogo de Capoeira, many of them started to um, describe it and they wanted to, there was a movement in the early 20th century to adopt this thing, this African practice which had been persecuted because of its Africanness and to now suddenly uh, promote it as a national form. And this happened very early, this movement started very early in the 19th century. And it's in the early 19th century we have people like um, Placid de Dubreuil, who is the first to come up with these very, uh, to deny the African origin of Capoeira. He wrote, quote, some attributed the origin of this to, bla to the black Africans, which I personally think is a mistake for the simple fact that in Africa our Jogo is not known, merely some forms of headbutting. To our natives, and this is referring to Native Americans, we also cannot attribute this because even though they have the agility, they don't know the methods that capoeira is used for attack and defense. The most rational explanation is that capoeirajin was created, developed, and perfected among us. And among us, he's a, he's a Portuguese Brazilian. Born in Portugal, actually, himself. Um, and this continues down to, to now, um, uh, less than a decade ago, Mara Jardim wrote that, quote, no cultural manifestation similar to capoeira was found in Africa. And therefore, the conclusion can be drawn that the expression capoeira Angola is a Brazilian creation without any cultural connotation with Africa, unquote. 
Now she's never been to Africa, she's never looked for anything, but this is the thing. At the heart of these denials is an ignorance of African martial arts. And in place of any real data or um, any documentation to support these things, they've still rather come up with, uh, scholars have come up with number of uh, origin myths. Uh, and there are two, uh, two kind of branches of these. The first branch uh, looks, at, looks at it as something that was born out of the Brazilian context. One of them says that, argues that the capoeira is a mixture, it combines the agility of the black with the, you know, just this kind of, is a mixture of Native American, you know, the generic uh, lusotropical mix. Uh, the problem with this is that this completely has no historical basis. We know from the historical documentation that in the first half of the 19th century, almost all of the capoeiras were enslaved and African-born. We do, uh, what we'll see is that mulattoes, Brazilian-born blacks, uh, and whites, start to enter into capoeira in the second half of the 19th century in significant numbers. There are a few scattered ones before that, but no, none in significant numbers before that. Now the next origin myth traces capoeira to Native Americans. And this has to do with political reasons um, in, in kind of in or this, is, this theory came up in a sense as a response to scientific racism which starts at the end of the 19th century. Brazilian scholars are trying to separate themselves from Europe and also not claim their Africanness because of uh, scientific racism, so they look to the Native Americans. Um, but unfortunately, um, Native Americans wrestle. They don't have anything akin to capoeira. Now, the next, probably the more popular uh, mythic explanations right now is first of all, uh, to describe it as a creole, um, and most people with this have described it as a mix of dances. First of all, uh, we should all be, I would warn everybody to be very careful with this term creole, because there is, either there is no such thing as a creole, or everything is a creole. If you mean by creole, something that's a mix of two different traditions, no one can name me an art form that's not a Creole. For example, English boxing. When English boxing starts in the 17th century or we're up into the 19th century, it's a mixture of pugilism with wrestling. It gets, when English boxing comes to North America, it is completely transformed. The way that Americans boxed was completely different than the way Englishmen boxed back in, in England. Right? In 18th century boxing, there was no jab, there was no uppercut, there was no hook, there was no right cross. There was a lead lunge, there were swings and chops. Mm -hmm. Compl nothing like what we know. The, the techniques that we think of as boxing today, the jab, uh, the uppercut, the, the, these are all techniques that are developed in America. Uh, but let's look at karate. Widely acknowledged that karate is a, is a mixture of indigenous Okinawan art, te, and Chinese, I mean, Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee mixed how many martial arts to make Jeet Kune Do. And yet, none of these other things are ever described as Creole. Why is it that only things made by black people are described as Creole? Okay, so we should be very clear to never use this term. Because if you use, if you define Creole and use it objective, everything's a Creole. And if everything's a Creole, the thing is meaningless. Scholars use it in terms of African diaspora culture to mean not African. <coughs> they mean it's changed. As if every other culture didn't change when it came to America. You don't see Americans walking around with those white English wigs on. <laughs> Right? Every culture changes. Everything about English culture changed. Everything about Irish culture, everything transforms. Right? There is no such thing that is not a Creole. So let's just get rid of that terminology right now. 
<laughs> now, then we get to the issue of all these people who have for uh, decades been saying, oh, capoeira is a mix of these various dances. There's a number of problems with these, this mixed dancing origin. The first is especially the, the story that we've all heard Slaves created capoeira as a way to defend themselves when they were chained. Right? You all, all heard that story? A complete, historically, completely hogwash because slaves, when they were chained, we have images of capoeiras who were, who were captured and chained, and guess what? They're chained by the leg. <laughs> right? Or they're chained by the neck. So that doesn't work at all. Obviously, if you chain a, a slave by his hands, he can run away and can't work. That's a bad idea. I mean, if you're into extracting labor from slaves. Now, there's another problem, and this is a problem that comes with logic. And we have to, um, we, I'm going to apply here something called Occam's razor. And this is a rule of logic that says no plurality should be assumed unless it can be proved by reason, experience, or some infallible authority. And there is no reason or logic or infallible authority to, to support such uh, a strange theory that, that people would combine dances to defend themselves. Right? We wouldn't do that, would we? <laughs> right? Who in here, if we were all enslaved and taken somewhere, uh, you know, no one would say, okay, you know a little ballet, I know some hip hop, let's just make up a way to defend themselves. Right? No one would ever do that. The problem with this is that it's based on a deficit theory. It is based on an ignorance of African martial arts. If you know, as Danny is going to, you're going to know after Danny finishes with you, if you know that there are martial arts all over Africa, why would you assume that someone has to use a dan mix dances to create a martial art? There are hundreds, if not thousands, of African martial arts coming from the areas that we know slaves were taken to Brazil. <coughs> Senegalese lamb, Zili, uh, Kambangula, Ekoche, uh, Headbutting from Angola, all of these. And, and Danny's going to, when Danny gets done with you, you're gonna, there's going to be no question. There are all these African martial arts. So why would someone who knew martial arts, why would pe a people who knew martial arts make up uh, uh, something from dance to defend themselves? Yes? Excellent, excellent point. So the que so the question is okay. So she was saying that it was probably described as a mixture of dances because to people who don't know any better, it looks like dance, and that's uh, that's a good point. Um, but again, this is also something from someone later and outside imposing on it. Now, you've all also heard the story that Capoeira was disguised as a dance so that the slaves wouldn't be arrested for doing it. This is a complete myth. If you look at the historical record, this is completely untenable because even dancing an African dance in Rio would get you arrested. <laughs> Having a drum in Rio would get you arrested. So no one's going to dance capoeira to drums and think it's going to help them with the police. <laughs> the police knew what the jogo de capoeira was. In fact, English, Irish, and German visitors who had only been in Brazil for a few months knew what the jogo de capoeira was. So no one was being fooled. That, that is a complete myth. It, there's also another problem with this uh, thing that, that it was a combination of dances. Or those people who call it a creole, well, if it's a Creole, what is it a mix of? Where are the punches from Dombe? Where are the, bo where are the arm breaks from Echo Che? Where are, where are all these quickly learned, devastating techniques of all these from these martial arts? We know there were Hausa in Brazil. Why are, why are those techniques not there? Because it's not a Creole. It's not a random mix of all the different African martial arts, just like it's not a mix of all the random African dances. 
There's another problem with this, uh, and that is that it goes in the face of the insider's understanding of the history of the art. Now, the slaves didn't keep documents and they couldn't tell us what they thought, but they could document their understandings of this art in the music and rhythms and rituals of capoeira. Now, in our tradition, and our tradition of capoeira comes from, from Salvador. Now, in Salvador, the vast majority of slaves who were taken to, enslaved Africans who were taken to Salvador, came from West Africa. Nago, JJ, they're all they're taken from the West African coast. Ant houses, they completely dominated numerically in Salvador. So the question is, why is it that our art form and our music and songs from Salvador, if all there are all these Africans, and most of them from West Africa, why is it that all of our rhythms in Capoeira relate to Angola? Angola, Benguela, São Bento Grande, who is the patron saint of where? Angola. Why? They, there's a clear, clearly, this a, a attachment, association to Angola is already built in in the emic understanding of the art. And I think it's quite problematic for scholars without any evidence to, to point to any, anything else coming from anywhere else with any certainty to fly in the face of this. All right, and to deny this internal understanding of the art, which I find very problematic. Now, um, so having eliminated all of these alternative myths, let's return to Mestre Pasquini's supposedly uncultured assumption that this comes from Angola. <laughs> um, I'm going to... I'm over my time, so I'm going to fly through this. Let me just talk a little bit about the Angolo. So the Angolo is a ritual practice that we can trace back to at least the 13th century. Excuse me, yes. Does that have a problem if we just go later and then start the party later? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I'll tell you then. Yes. So, um, so one asked me, in terms of the prevalence of Angola uh, in Brazil, if there are hundreds of you know, various African martial arts, how is it different precedent you know, over anything else, even though there were people from different parts of West Africa that came? Excellent question. And can I answer that a little later on? Okay. Because um, it, it'll, it'll come up later. Right? So the question was, if there are Africans from all these places with different martial arts, <laughs> why is it that capoeira is you know, is coming directly from the Angola, and we'll get to that. But so why is it the only one that is really present in Brazil? That we still it's, see now. It's not the only one present in Brazil. It's the, oh, it's the one that's been popularized and, and gotten media attention, but it's not the only one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's coming from the houses and the Yoruba, the, the Islamicized Yoruba people. Mm -hmm. But that, again, that is a very specific cultural influence that's coming in the 19th century as a result of the breakup of the Oyo Empire and the, the creation of... No, there were, there were definitely Muslims before the 19th century, but um, in terms of the, the real specific influence on afro bayan culture, it's really a, a 19th century phenomenon because after the breakup of the Oyo Empire and the creation of the Sokoto Caliphate that for the first time at the end of the 18th century brings all these people in large numbers together um, and really solidify. That's where we see the most... Uh, but there's been Islam in Brazil since the earliest of times. West Africans, uh, Senegal, the people from the Senegambian region brought Islam very early on. Yeah. But I'm talking about in, the, in terms of the prevalence of terms like Abadah and stuff entering into the general African vocabulary that happens, those kind of cultural things are strongest in the 19th century. Because the numbers really just change at that point. So, um, so Capoeira, uh, so the Angolo, I was saying um, it is a 
an art is practiced in the southern part of Angola. It is. <laughs> okay. okay, I don't know if these are big enough for you guys to see. So I just wanted to show you kind of the range of the techniques in Angolo. So very much, um, you will recognize most of them as techniques we have in Capoeira. Uh, this one's getting cut off on your screen. This is uh, a headbutt, a handstand, a headstand, cartwheel, circular kick, a low defensive squat like we, like Cocarina, circular kick, spinning away from the kick, turning the back as a defense. Um, and these invert these kicks from a fully inverted position, which were very important in the spiritual understanding of the art, um, because doing this by inverting yourself, you associate yourself with the power of the ancestors. And the art, the angolo as an art form, was tied to uh, mastery was required initiation into a <laughs> type of an ancestor cult. I don't want to call it cult, but uh, special ancestor, ancestor worship ceremony. So here we have, now again, if you think back to the Habajihai with the two legs, from, from, from we don't do it anymore, but from <coughs> this was quite prevalent in uh, Angolo. Awu switching away. Um, what we would call now a Habajihaya and a Skiva or a Negativa or something. Where are these pictures taken? These pictures are taken in Southern Angola. I took these myself. Mm. This man right here is my Angolo master. He's, uh, he's, really, he's really got a wonderful game. Um, again, the defense, ducking out of the way or just like, you know, we do here, go with Skiva with it and give a Hashtere. Well, the children maybe didn't have geography yet. Angola's in Africa. Thank you. That's important, you know. That is important. Thank you, John. I don't have geography. Now, um, let's, let's come back now to um, the Jogo de Capoeira in Rio. It's clear that the historical, the linguistic, the demographic evidence all supports uh, Mestre Pashina's supposedly uncultured premise that the Jogo de Capoeira evolved directly out of the Angolo. Now, no, no other martial arts in the world, are, yeah, we'll give me one second, I'm just wrapping up. So no other martial arts um, in the world share are so cognated as the Angolo and Capoeira. The only exception is North American knocking, uh, uh, kicking, and some other arts which are also derived from the Angolo. There's, there's no one can question that there's a higher correlation between those arts than between capoeira and any other martial art in the world. Capoeira shows up in the second half of, of the 18th century at the exact same time that Brazilian, and particularly slave traders from Rio, because the southern slave, uh, the slave trade in the southern region of Angola and Benguela was dominated by slave traders from Rio. It's in that same time that capoeira first appears in Rio it's the exact same time that Brazilian slave traders in Angola first penetrate the interior. Very coincidental. And to get back to your question, why is it that in Rio, uh, capoeira is becomes the dominant art? This would just the, the, the Angolo style becomes the predominant art. Well, in Rio de Janeiro. 85% of the enslaved Africans who went to Rio de Janeiro came from Angola. The largest number of those came from where? Southern Angola, where the Angola was practiced. Hmm. <laughs> Doesn't take rocket scientists um, to put two and two together. Um, Yes. 
Yeah, so when I'm, when I'm talking about Angola, I'm just saying roughly this, this region. Uh, that <coughs> what is termed Angola? Uh, Abel asked a good question, what, what is Angola? Are we talking about the current modern day uh, uh, def- map? Yeah, I, I'm, using it, I'm using it similar to that term. It's roughly that area. In the 19th century, and what would be considered Angola, the, the terminology was different because uh, Portuguese and Brazilian slave traders had one definition, and British and French had another definition because the British and French, because uh, the Portuguese held Luanda, the British and uh, French had to do their slave trading either farther in the north or farther in the south. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. How do they call themselves? They don't call. No, I mean, do they have a name. No, no, they don't have a name for themselves. Oh. Like in 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 the, in the sense that most people who do it, um, they they didn't call themselves a, like top no, not, not most artists. A name okay. is a name. Oh, what what is the name of the people who practice? It? Well, there's multiple people who practice it, um, but we can refer to them as Simbabwezians. There are al- there are other people who, who also practice it, but the focal group that I that I use um, is Simba Okay, so I, I thought you meant the people who practice it. There is a term for, but it's only referred to people who undergone the initiation. See them. When you took that picture, they were playing music too or no music? Hand clapping. Yeah, just hand clapping. The only the only instrument I ever saw um, played during the Angola was a drum, which uh, I don't think I have on this slide. Yeah, it's between the legs. So it's not a drum that stands up, but it's a drum that lays on its side and people sit on it. Well, I'm not a musician, so I wasn't analyzing it like that, but. If I if I dig up the dig- video tape, I'll, you can tell me. Yeah. Do they seem for you that they were playing a strategy game because you are with a couple years, or they seem that they are like dancing to attack? It's like straightforward, or they just rise and attack? Both. Um, uh, you know, it really depends on the person. Now, here's the thing. This is. Uh, a dying art form in Angola. In Angola, um, there's a there's a clear difference between people, young people who do it today. Most of them are not really practitioners, we, we can call that. But when you see when you see uh, a master of Angola play, oh, it's very strategic. I mean, they're they're you know, they're, but. A lot of the people who do play, they play, they, you know, they drink and they get in, they just have fun and they, they often don't do a jinga, they kind of like jump from side, like if they see you're going to kick this way, they go this way, they go this way, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, you know what? Can we come? Yes. Yeah, and, yes. Uh, I'm very specific on this quest, but you want to, if you want to want. Yes, yeah, no, please. Can talk up. But can you tell me the specific place, the name, where we do the day? This part of the city. Or we can talk about later. Well, we can talk later, but in the whole region, there's not just one place. No, no, but uh, where you were, what the I, specific I spent, place, what you thought. Let's say I spent two years okay. in this whole region. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't stay in one village, I, I moved around, so it's yes. not just all from one place. <laughs> Um, oh, you sh- actually, hold on. Uh, let me end this. So, uh, for example, if I can, where's my? Uh, <laughs> Don't have everything. I lost my cursor. <laughs> on the, okay, here we go. Were you in the same region? That, but that's as I thought. We were later on. You talked about yeah. three years. Yeah. Just, that's what that's why I asked you specifically because I wanted to make a comparison. Okay, so yeah. It's, I, you were in, you went to Mokope. Yeah, Mokope. Uh, so, 
I, I was in Makofi, I was in a lot of places, but, it, 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 but there's, a diff, there's a different stylistically with yeah, Makofi yeah, now to these other yeah, places. That's, 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 yes. Do people have an issue here? Nope. Very rarely. Very rarely. Do they have them more often before? Like yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, but you think about the for the Ningolu initiation. Yes, you're talking about specific, yeah, the, I mean, initiations in general, yeah. But for this specific initiation, it's rare now. Hold on one second, let me see if I can find... Uh, actually, I'm going to run and take up time. I'm going to ask, invite Danny to come up and, and start where Danny goes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, all right. Um, were there any other specific, what, what we'll do is after Danny finishes, yeah, then we'll open it up. Because uh, Mestre has also been to Southern Angolo. Uh, Southern Angolo. <laughs> Southern Angola, he's also seen Angolo. And then we can open it up to more general questions with the three of us answering at the end. I'm going to also ask you to take a five minute break so you can just get some fresh air. Okay.